not everybody understands what canine behaviorists does because in the dog world you have dog trainers and you have dog behaviorists mm -hmm. and most dog behaviorists are normally excellent dog trainers yeah because the two it's two sides of the same coin yeah if you just come in and say as a behavior you study behavior mm. the solutions for a lot of the behavioural problems is actually connected to control of the They're dog. They're just intrinsically linked, yeah. aren't they? You so know, if, you, if you've got your dog able to sit or stay, mm. it's not going to run to a dog to engage mm. in aggression, whatever type of aggression. Mm. So the advantage of being a highly skilled trainer puts you well above somebody who comes out of university with an academic a piece of paper saying they've studied theory. Yeah. And, and they're not comparable, mm. I, I would say. Mm. So when you're um, looking at behavior issues, and this is from practical experience, mm -hmm. the skill set, the knowledge you've gained, the hundreds if not thousands of dogs you've engaged with, what would you say are the top three behavior problems you deal with? And then we'll start with one of them. Okay, so as far as behavioural issues with dogs, I think first of all, you hit on a very good point there, is what differentiates a training and a behavioural problem. And the two things, training and behaviour, are intrinsically linked in my opinion, and one doesn't go without the other. Because to be a good dog trainer, you've got to understand how a dog thinks and its behaviour. To be a good behaviourist, you must understand how to train a dog as well and training is a very important element when we look at behavior modification because some issues we do require management and we do require training that is part of programs there but how i look at it when a client um, rings me up with a dog with a problem a typical client will ring up and in fact funnily enough i only had one the other day who rang me up and said i've been referred to you by the vet i have a puppy and i want to bring your the puppy to pub classes to train it but on speaking to the lady it became very clear that this puppy was a 10 month old dog that actually barked at other dogs aggressively and barked at people aggressively and didn't like to go out for walks because it was nervous now to me that is a behavioral issue that is not a training problem so how i explain it to people when they ring me and when they speak to me and how i like to think of it myself is Training is something where we teach the dog. So something like teaching a sit, teaching a recall, teaching a dog to walk on slightly. So we're training or teaching a behavior that we require. Whereas behavior, when we look at a behavioral problem, it's more how the dog's thinking. So with training, we could have a dog that's highly trained, you know, could perform all sorts of manners of tricks, wonderful things, and be a super obedient. However, if the behavior is not right, for an example, with dog-to-dog -dog aggression, which is a very common problem that I see, then no matter how much training you do, you're not changing how that dog's thinking. Towards the other dog. Towards the other dog. Its behavior is reflecting how it's thinking. So quite often that's where it can fall down because we might try and train a dog to walk nicely on a slack lead and it might do it brilliantly, but put a dog in the equation and the dog barks because it feels under threat and it's how it's thinking at that time. So behavior, as you know, is all about manipulating how the dog responds and changing associations, etc. cetera. Um, very simplistic way of putting it there because as you know and appreciate it, it's not simplistic. It's quite in depth. It takes a lot of skill and a lot of knowledge. And we look at each case as an individual case. But in essence, that's how I would view it. We training, it's teaching, behaviours have the dog's so thinking. How would you then, if we just dissect that, examine it slightly. If you've got a very well-trained dog, and I'm talking of a very well-trained dog, mm -hmm. that sits and stays without 20 commands, one command, mm -hmm. when it enters the range of another dog, which may cause it to, be, to become aggressive mildly or seriously. Yeah whether it's fear or whether it's rank challenging, mm -hmm. would you agree that the trained dog, despite you not addressing the reason, what motivates the dog to be mm -hmm. like that to another dog, it's better to have a trained dog so you can control it in that situation. Yeah. Mm. It's going to break the dangerous dogs act, which mm. is critical. Mm. Otherwise you could end up with a prison sentence or, um, 
being fined in court, yeah. and your dog being um, taken off you. So by having the control, that's yeah. it's not going to change its view of dogs. No. Because if you're in that situation with an untrained dog, mm. it, and this is what we meet, it's generally a nightmare. Yeah. Because very few dogs we meet mm. are highly trained. Well, exactly. Yes. Colour. I mean, if yeah. somebody can't walk the dog down the street with no distraction there, no people, no other dogs, and they come to me and they say, you know, my dog barks at other dogs when it sees other dogs, and it owls and it's embarrassing, it pulls and barks, it shows aggression. But if they can't walk the dog on a slack lead with no distraction and no dogs there, they don't stand a hope in hell's chance of doing no, it no. when you put that dog into no. the equation. So we have to look at establishing a behaviour um, and establishing training. It's, as I say, is so intrinsically and important. And as you quite correctly say, um, control is huge. But even in that situation where we might have that dog, that's super well behaved, for example, a dog with extreme chase instinct and chase problems. You might have a dog that while the owner's there, because the owner is there, it is now under control and it won't chase something because it's under control, the owner can recall it or the dog's walking to heel or whatever. It will not do that because it, it, it views the owner as controlling that situation. But take the owner away then we, the behaviour will still come back and the behaviour will be there. But then potentially we have a dog that goes and chases livestock, etc. And it's amazing how many times I've, when I've had a client with a, a fearful, nervous dog biter mm. and I'm in a public place and they're introducing me to what the dog does. I don't know that before mm. I get to the park and quickly I, I assess that this dog is fear driven to bite. Mm. And one of the experiments I learned in the 1980s. So when I'm walking in Hyde Park with a dog, and this is not a dog that's manic and leaping at people, it's a mm. dog that's just marginally fearful. Mm. And when dogs come in a certain range, we, you know, we have the range like a bullseye on a dartboard. Mm. I always imagine a bullseye and a dart. I'm the bullseye with the owner, mm. and there's different ranges coming down the dartboard where mm. it, the different dog will see and react to the other dogs with growling, staring, or, yeah. or body language mm. of fearfulness. And then so one day I realized, and this was in the 80s, more by accident, I took the lead off the, the owner and I mm. walked the dog. Mm. And the dog stopped. Yeah. Mm. So just by changing handlers, mm. and I also made the owner walk parallel with me about 20 feet away. Mm. And it was amazing. And then, then we swapped back again, and the dog, as we met other dogs going through Hyde Park, which is mm -hmm. about three miles long, it's a big park, and the dog go back to the normal. Mm -hmm. But when you think, you know, knowing with our knowledge, there's no surprise in that. So no. perhaps the owner, it is, you know, why is my dog not doing that with you? But of course, the relationship's very different, and how you portray yourself and the subliminal messages that you as an expert send to that dog have a major impact on how that dog then responds and behaves. And when we look at issues like dogs that are aggressive towards other dogs, there's always an underlining element of fear. Because if the dog didn't have some sort of fear, anxiety or stress element that was affecting that, it would have no need to bark, lunge, try and bite another dog. It would just happily get on with things. So quite often, as you, you know, and it, this happens a lot in vets, doesn't it? I mean, how many times do we take a dog to the vets and the vets will say, oh gosh, I'd much rather take the dog off the owner and go and do the procedure the than works. have, because the dog will behave itself. Yeah. So it's that relationship that's absolutely, you know, fundamental when we're looking at behavioral issues that we get that right. Well, our veterinary nurses who are members of the CFPA point this out because they've seen it hundreds of times. Mm. You know, they always want to get rid of the owner yeah. to calm the dog down. Mm. And in the park, um, one of the first things I noticed when I began filming them, I got a, a cameraman to film me, I noticed the clenching of the lead by the owner. Mm. And that was sending a signal to the mm. dog that there's something going to happen that's mm. negative. Mm. So it became a reinforcer. Accidentally, mm. not on purpose, mm. and of course I had a loose lead, so mm. the dog wasn't being strangled mm. up by its neck like this. The dog was loose, mm. and he was looking around. And obviously, I used methods to encourage yeah. him and some rewards and touch. Mm. I sometimes would start playing with the dog. Mm. It was trying mm. to concentrate on 
the target dog mm. and that I was trying to play with it. Mm. So to, to, to disrupt that and not make the normal rep repetition each day. And of course, not just that, you know, there's even more subtle things. What I think is quite often overlooked um, by dog owners in general is that we put our, um, our view of things as a human on that dog. And I don't mean, you know, that we're treating them like another human or like a child, etc. But what we're forgetting is fundamentally a dog as a species is an expert reader of body language. It will pick up, you know, it hears different ranges than we hear. It's obviously highly, highly developed sense of smell going on there. You know, what are we emitting as an owner when we see a dog coming? We know our dog's going to bark, we're worried about it, we're, you know, our adrenaline's pumping away. What's that dog picking up? So they're so subtle, these are all these other things, whereas you as the expert, you don't betray it. You don't have that because you know no. you see that dog. Like you're in control. And also, mm. you're more confident about if something mm. goes awry, mm. your ability to stop it instantly and control it gives you the confidence to continue. Mm. Whereas the owner, yeah, they've had a lot of bad experiences. Of course, yeah. And they think if this goes awry, it'll be like last mm. time. There'll be people shouting at them. The mm. dogs engaging in aggression. Mm. Um, so it's that historic element, isn't it? But yes, it's also, this yeah. is a historic element from the dog's perspective, is every time you've got me on the lead as the owner and something comes, oh my gosh, meltdown, all this happens. Whereas there's no history when you take hold of that dog. So it doesn't know, there's another unknown element there, so it hasn't got that history or that habit or even that to fall back on as well. So that can certainly help. But that, you know, we've got to, you know, that might happen. But ultimately that doesn't solve the issue for the owner because at the end of the day it's their dog and we as our behaviors have got to make sure that you know that if we're doing our job right is that we can get the owner to be able to do it it's no use me i mean it is a, it's an element because i think it gives them some confidence if they can see that the likes of you or i can take that dog and and work that dog but we're experts and we're professionals and we do it every day of our lives pretty much so we've honed our skills really well but they've got to be able to do that so we're not looking when we're looking at behavior in particular but also obviously training but we're not just looking at the dog we've got this really important element that person so we've got the dog with an issue and we've also got a, a, a owner that's not got that experience not got that expertise hasn't maybe even got the uh, motor skills maybe some of the motor skills that we might use when we're utilizing the lead timing big one huge one um, consistency again coming into things so there's all these elements there and that's what i think makes um, behavior such a skillful area when we're dealing with behavioral problems um, and that's why it, well, it definitely is a very skilled area well, one of the things I've always taught at the Cambridge Institute of Dog Behaviour and Training is that um, sometimes students can be overcritical of dog owners. Mm. And to me, sometimes that's an easy way out. Well, also, do you know what? I, the way I look at that is, you know, if the person's there seeking your advice, then they're a pretty responsible owner. You know, they've made that effort. Or a desperate owner. Yeah, well, desperate, but they've, they've yeah. identified that. They're not just walking along going, well, my dog wants to attack every dog, so so be it, it doesn't matter. Or I'm not going to take my dog out again, it's going to be incarcerated in my house. They are actually trying to do something about it. And I actually always view owners in a positive light myself, because I, I think it's hugely, you know, it's, it's just something that, you know, we need to celebrate that they're doing something about it. Um, and acknowledge that. And okay, so owners might do the wrong thing, but I'm sure nobody bets a dog and goes, oh, I want this dog to grow up to be dog aggressive. No way are they gonna want that, no. you know? And they've not and done it deliberately. Another thing we teach at the Cambridge Institute is, and again, I think some people in the learning phase of becoming dog behavior practitioners is, the owner is a conduit of all your knowledge that you're going to convey and transfer to the owner. Mm. So the owner doesn't have confidence in you mm. or you're one of those berating, wagging the finger, trainers, stroke yeah. behaviorists, then you're forming a psychological gap between you and them. You have to focus on the owner in the sense that they are the conduit and yeah. without their cooperation, the Huge. dog can Huge. not change exactly and not cannot. only that every situation is unique you know we might see a dog that's aggressive but you know it's got a it's that particular unique dog that particular unique person that particular unique 
relationship. These are fundamentally important when we're looking at being able to get success with owners and their dogs. And the other thing, I think with behaviour in general, I think behaviour sort of came in as this, say many years ago now actually scarily, but it came in as this um, separate section almost to training. And it came in that, you know, you had a dog trainer and you had this behaviourist. It was almost like they were on a pedestal, that there was a science behind it. It was an academic type of thing. Now, I'm, I am somebody who is a keen advocate on academic knowledge and understanding. I think it's my responsibility as an expert in what I do to make sure that I know what those academic um, science research papers, etc., show and what's behind and learning theories, etc. However, if I start bombarding my clients with what scientists did this, what learning theory did that, oh we're now doing a little bit of that quadrant, so whatever. It, it's relevant to them. Just going back to the beginning of our conversation, to the dog that I said is either well trained or not trained and sees a mm. dog that's making it react in an aggressive way. We said that the training can control the dog, that's why mm. it's critical that you have good dog training skills. Mm and the owner learns those skills. Yeah. And without that, you're not going anywhere in behavior because you have to be able to stay in that environment to change the dog's mind. So the behavioral side is changing the dog's view mm -hmm. of that dog and any other dog it may meet. And, mm -hmm. and, and how, would you, how would you profit information on that? I mean, there's so many different methods of doing it and it all depends, as you know, on why the dog's actually doing that. But what is important is actually coming up with a programme that works. I think it's absolutely vital that you as an expert handle dog. I mean, I handle the dogs myself. I will work a dog. Now I'm not doing, I'm doing that because at that point I'm assessing how that dog's responding to what I'm doing. Because if the method I give isn't gonna work with that dog, that's pointless me trying to teach that owner. But equally, I've got to come up with, and as you know, you've got to come up with a method that's going to work for that dog, but if the owner can't implement it, waste of time as well. So we're looking at this balance. So one of the things that I like to do, and I think is absolutely vital, you have to see the dog. You have to see the dog in action with the owner, see what's actually happening, obviously under safe conditions, um, controlled conditions. But you then need to have that confidence and ability and knowledge that you can work the dog. Because as you know, when you actually work a dog yourself, then you're getting and absorbing a lot of information that you wouldn't be getting by just watching that dog in action with the owner. Um, so then we can then look at what's going to work best, how we're we going to um, implement that, and then it's down to being able to translate that through to the owner and to get the owner to do that with you there. Now what, I mean, one of the big problems, as you will know, is that you see somebody for that period of the time and even if you repeat that and have subsequent sessions with that owner, is they are having to learn something, a new skill. And it would be like, you know, teaching me a new skill. I, I, I always say to people, don't worry. You like know, cooking. if I went and did your, yeah, cooking, there we go. <laughs> cooking, cleaning, housework. You know, if you, if I, if there was a skill there and I had to learn it, I'm not going to learn it in a couple of hours. I'm not going to have refined it in that point. So that, again, is a huge thing that we've got to overcome. Yes, well, I, um, I'm going to ask you to give uh, an example and you can't describe the entire case because a case will be two or three hours in conversation with somebody and then many hours thereafter reforming the dog's behaviour. And I always use the word reformation to reform the dog. Mm. And then I'll give you an example of one that's just cu currently I've been observing in my own village. So can you give me an example? bearing in mind it's not going to be the whole case of just where you've got a dog to say tolerate another dog without reacting aggressively. Yeah, I think, you know, when one of the first things that we've got to look at is look at people's expectation. Because if an owner is coming along with a dog that has an aggression issue to other dogs and they expect that a dog is going to go and like every single dog it meets and allow them to jump all over and it's going to play and, you know, everything's going to be nice and happy, there's very few dogs that are going to change from being aggressive to there. But what we look at is percentage of improvement. And that's what I'm interested in. That's what I look at when I'm assessing a dog. So we have to look at what's realistic, what's attainable. Are we going to end up at the end of this with a dog that we can walk down the street 
on a nice flat lead and it sees a dog and it's quite happy about it and it doesn't feel threatened um, because that's normally the starting point when we're looking at dogs that are aggressive towards dogs so for example only last week i saw a client who'd got a little um, only a small dog small breed of dog um, that was barking like crazy at other dogs so the lady um, would be taking the dog out as soon as she saw another dog the dog's flying at the end of the lead bark 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 but when talking and looking and assessing this dog it became very clear that this dog actually thought it could do whatever it wanted when it wanted so it became very apparent very quickly to me that I needed to address that side of things because I can't have a dog that's fearful this dog was fearful that's why I was exhibiting the behavior but if it didn't believe in respect and feel safe with the owner there was no chance Yes, we could every time well, it sees a dog, yeah, yeah, see, those manage dogs, it. Those dogs don't even acknowledge the owner. In they that, don't. In that they don't because they don't feel they've got the confidence that the owner's going to deal with the situation. Yeah. So this particular dog, it was very, very important that we looked at. And this is the, sometimes the problem with behaviour and getting this across is somebody will come along with a problem like this lady, dog barks at other dogs. But actually... The thing that's causing and the foundation that's causing this problem is relationship with owner is not correct in the first place. And if we just manage it and deal with head on dog barks at other dogs, we wouldn't get the same sort of success that we get. What we have to do is be very holistic and we have to look at the factors that are absolutely critical to why that problem is taking place. So with this particular dog, it was a case of looking at that relationship between owner and dog and putting that right because we don't want the dog the dog felt threatened the owner's no good at all it's now protecting the owner as well as itself because it's not happy about things but we've then got to change that relationship which is relatively easy to do to be fair um, so that the dog starts to respect the owner and realize actually don't worry we want that situation when the dog's it's okay You've got my back i'm happy about that and that changes very much how the dog thinks and puts you in that position where you're more likely to get success people who who work in this industry they miss the subtleties yeah you're and, right and it takes mm. i think it takes decades of knowledge and mm. learning and practice to watch the subtleties so you you just described that situation so we have the dog in the first place paying no attention to the owner while it goes through mm. its barking uh, freako behavior at the other dog and mm. then eventually 25 yards it calms down because the mm. distance has got but once the dog learns as you described to start to focus on the owner a bit more and form a communication mm. that is less time for the dog to solely focus on the dog yeah. to bark at. Yeah. so you've interrupted it mm just by it's got to keep looking and looking because it's now learning to pay some attention to the owner by whatever method they're using or training mm. or so what the dog's learning is it now has to focus on you mm. by the methods rewards you've mm. started to train the dog's now learning and it would have you would you would have kind of pre-learned it probably in the garden or house through some diversion training redirected methodologies to start paying attention to you and that generally is through dog training if, if mm. you're wise so now when you come across this situation you just described there's a competition now in the dog's mind between paying attention to you and focusing on the dog and over time with repetition and lots of good rewards mm. and a powerful reward is getting attention off you mm. at that time uh, and along with all the other learning you'll get off the behaviorist about distances and parallel walking and so mm. on the dog is now interrupted not just by giving it a treat but it's interrupted by attempting to listen to you because there's a reward mm. within that of mm. communication and that's less time focusing on the target dog that, yeah. it's, that it's reacting aggressively to and I think that's vital because when you look at what you're saying there, we've also got to remember that we've got to create a foundation that's going to build to success. We almost want building blocks that come there. We, the problem nowadays, um, in general, we're quite a quick society. We're the instant society. We want instant result, instant mm. achievement. And also, we can also be flummoxed by that dog being worked by the expert, you or myself, and the dog appear to be okay because we've got that skill set to create that. YouTube. 
Exactly. So what we have to do is look at putting those building blocks in place, but ultimately, you know, sometimes there are behaviours that are unacceptable, that we've got to be in the position that we say to that, that dog that that's not acceptable. You barking at that other dog, trying to bite that dog, is not acceptable. So we have to stop that, and then we can reward the response that we want. Because if we don't put these parameters in place, then we have a dog that doesn't understand, and a lot of the time these dogs are reacting um, in this aggressive manner because they just think that they can. They, they don't understand. It's just a repetitive Exactly. It becomes a habit. And every incident, without mm. you interrupting, mm. compounds it. Exactly. But also, and a, a, another interesting case that I had relatively recently was a lady who was a very good agility competition lady with a dog. Great success with this um, Border Collie. And she clicker trained the dog which you know, I'm a big, as you know, big advocate of training. I've used it for many years with different species as well as dogs. But this lady was using clicker training, but she had a big issue of the dog barking at other dogs. And she found it very embarrassing. You know, she's quite a name in the sport and she found it very embarrassing. And she asked me to have a look and see what was going on. Now, what was actually happening, which she couldn't see, by virtue of the fact of where the dog is in relation to her, she's walking past dogs and in the environment, is when she was clicking, the dog's mind was still on the problem of wanting to be or about to be or still focused on, I'm not happy about that dog there. That's timing. That's timing. But she couldn't see it because she was on top of it. But having that other set of eyes, we could do that because it is vital. You know, if we get that timing wrong, and how many dogs do you see, not just aggressive dogs, but dogs with other problems, even just general training problems, you see, it's because the owner's trained it by mistake, inadvertently, by the timing being wrong. The dog that you know we don't want that dog mithering us and coming up for attention however when it does we, we acknowledge it we don't have to think of it as a reward it might be that we go go away but it's still acknowledging the fact it's there it's still getting what it wants and the same as you know it's, it's a very common scenario with particularly with aggressive dogs that you know people are embarrassed and because they're embarrassed they tend to go into the mode of come on, it's okay, or pull the bags of food out, try and distract the dog. And instead of the dog saying, this is great, I have a dog coming, bark, big bag of chicken here. So it's making sure that we might manage that. And that's why it's so important, as you know, that we assess a dog properly with the owner. So talk to me, you know, when if I hear that, and it does happen, unfortunately, you know, on occasions where I see clients where they've seen behaviourists, and that behaviourist has not seen their dog. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I find that so frustrating because every time, yes, somebody can describe something just as I can describe something to you or you to me, but that's subjective how I then interpret that. But if you see that happening, you take the dog and feel it and experience it happening, and then you're in the position to do a proper assessment and then you're in the position to put a proper behavioural program in place that's going to have what you want the desired response and let's be honest I mean we're looking at percentage improvement the you know nobody can turn around and say that a dog's never going to do something again when it's done it nobody can do that it's impossible to say but what we're looking at is improving that dog and we're looking at improvement levels where it's going to make a big impact on that dog's life and that owner's life. So, I mean, I don't know how what percentage improvement you look for, but I look for about 75% plus because we're not looking just at the financial commitments an owner puts in. We're looking at the emotional commitment and the time and the effort that they're putting into dealing well, with that I'll dog. I'll tell you what I, and we're all different, I'll tell you what I, I expect and then I'll move on to the next dog the mm -hmm. one I'm going to discuss. My idea of minimal improve, this is, the, I gotta start from the minimum, okay. not the maximum. Okay. The minimum is if a person comes to me with a dog that's snapping very seriously or leaping or lunging at dogs, causing other road users to be in fear of either being bitten themselves or by the dog, mm. which of course breaks the dangerous dogs out in 1991. Mm -hmm. These are serious cases. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So my idea is that all my dogs and I would say the overwhelming majority have achieved a level where I can walk past any dog mm. that formerly we couldn't mm. with not a sound. Yeah. The dog's healing. Mm. It doesn't mean I've taught that dog to like other dogs mm. and it doesn't mean that dog likes other dogs. Mm. What it's learned is that the certain things I don't accept mm. 
A dog can never know why you're doing that because it mm. doesn't think like us. Mm. But what it knows, in this situation, it can't react this yeah, way. Yeah, I agree. Mm. In the same situation, when in a house with another dog, it learns that it can't react this way because the other dog will react in a, in a negative way to it and it mm. learns not to do that. Mm. And it's back to what we're saying about being realistic. So yeah. when I look at, when I'm, to clarify that, when I'm talking about 75% improvement, what I'm looking at is the whole picture. So I'm looking at, you know, that dog, yes, I agree, we should be able to walk every dog past people, dogs, no issue. That's 100%, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, and that's the minimum. And if, if you aim for that, mm. then everything else is a plus. Yeah. Um, but let me move on to this case, Abedil. Um, so this is not a client of mine. This is a lady I met on a walk with a Doberman. And I met her when the Doberman was, I think, 16 weeks of age. And eventually we stopped and chat. I stopped her and chatted to her because I could see there was a serious behaviour problem. Well, and I saw this lady walking towards me. This is in the countryside on a um, bridle path, so it's quite wide. It's mm -hmm. four or five metres wide. And when we got within a range of about 10 yards, uh, Quintus is just ambling along because he's very good with dogs. And then he started screaming. You know, Dover mm. got this high pitched scream. And when the puppy is even higher, it sounds like he's being murdered. Mm. And the woman's getting embarrassed. I could see her. And you can all spot their body language because they become uncomfortable because mm. they think you're making judgments about them and they've got a mad dog. Of course, when it got within three feet of me it was now screaming barking snapping snarling like it was possessed by the devil this this dog couldn't have been more than i don't know two three months old probably four months old so i i moved away to about 10 feet and it was still screaming and then i just said to the lady can i have a word with you about the dog screaming and she consented to that um, she thought I was going to tell her off, I think, but I wasn't. Mm. So I got this dog not to move. He just stood there and slowly the screaming came to a halt after about a minute. There was nothing. If he turned his head, it was scream, scream, Start scream. Again, yeah. Bed, right. So any movement from him got his screaming. Mm. And I, so we had a chat and she told me where she got it from. And, and then she told me that there's several dogs it plays with and it doesn't do this to any of the other dogs it's only to a strange dog it's not seen before mm. so i didn't tell her what i did for a living i never do when i meet people outside it seems odd to me that you would start announcing what you do i just said to her can i give you some tips on that and she said of course um so i chatted to her and then i said let's do an experiment so I started letting his lead go and this puppy was so keen to meet him but frightened of him mm. and she kept coming over to him fortunately he was good he just stood there and and if he turned his head to sniff face to face she starts screaming again and go back mm. to cut a very long story short in a quarter of an hour mm. I call this boring her to death, boring the Doberman to death. Mm. So there's nothing to bark about. Yeah. He's done nothing. She stopped completely. Mm. And then we let them sniff. Mm. Then he went to sniff her, her genitalia, as dogs do, to say hello, their business card. And she wasn't keen on that. There was the odd little squeal. After an hour, well, I was getting bored to death. I think the woman was, silence. Mm. And I said, do you know what I was doing there? With your dog because i was chatting to her about this dog this entire time about where she got it from where she socialized it what dogs it was good mm -hmm. with and we were just talking but in this same time obviously i was very aware that the doberman was working him out that he was quite safe mm -hmm. and by the time we parted there was no noise mm -hmm. and the two dogs were aligned next to each other mm -hmm. if i'd have got him to run or jump it probably would have yeah, that's set off, it. yeah set off again now that was about i don't know six months ago mm. the dog's now about 14 months old or something and i've seen her once or twice and we've met once or twice and we have a little bit of screeching and barking and hysterical behavior but much milder mm. probably 90 percent less mm. and then when i met her last week um, she's walking along with the dog 
she's giving it the odd treat that I noticed, so that must be the trainer telling her that. But the dog walked past me without a sound. Now you could say that's because she got to know who he is mm. and I said well she's really improved she says yes she's improved with lots of dogs and I did encourage her to have a little toy with her and the mm. toy works Quintus mm. the toy works with her mm. and she um, now that dog's on its way mm. to, to being what, 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 we, what we thought it would be so by that type of I would call latent socialization mm. But there was no rhyme or reason for that dog being like that because that woman had done everything correct that you should do by people that we advise. But that's, don't and you there's think? There's still something there in the, maybe in the breed. Maybe the in genetics. the dog, yeah. Maybe, and I think there are these predispositions. But that said, you know, we can't use that as an excuse. You know, we've got to deal with that because those dogs exist. So we have to be able to be flexible enough to be able to work around those things. So, you know, that's the ultimate get out, isn't it? It's genetics. It can't do it. It can't do anything with genetics. But we have to be able to manage behaviours at times. So sometimes it is about management, going back to what we were saying about training as well. Um, but also, you know, what the lady's saying, and again, you know, you don't need me to tell you that, you know, what the people tell you isn't necessarily, it's their take on it, it's their subjective opinion. I've done everything right. I've socialised this dog. It started this, well, we've never, I don't know why it's done, it's never done it before. And they're quite genuine in what they're saying. But actually, if you had been this fly, fly on the wall, fly on the on the wall, wall yeah. scenario, it'd be yeah. very, very different. And, and that will be the case mm. in lots of uh, cases that are presented to you. Yeah. With this particular lady, I said to her, originally when the puppy was small i said if we don't sort this out now when i say we i meant her mm. i said if it compounds and embeds once it's embedded mm. then other dogs would be less tolerant as it leaves puppyhood yeah or less mm. tolerant and then you can have a clash and then mm. a reinforcement of a fight mm. and once they started to fight then you've got a serious mm. problem because you don't forget mm. fighting however whatever you do afterwards and it was just so nice to see her going along with the dog yeah. it had a mm. face wrong um and the other thing you see where people quite often and i you know i get many clients will say this to say well i don't understand why it wants to be aggressive towards those dogs because you know it's okay with the dogs it lives with you know and they don't understand that that's different that they live with those dogs it's it's part of its own family if you like so it's got those relationships formed so it will have you confident well, it may have mm. occurred as mm. i've seen other cases where when we've backtracked so I investigate dog behavior with my mm. original police background. I investigate it mm. and I go for micro points of its early growing up stages, point by point, week by week. Mm. And it could have been playing with a dog and got nipped sharply on mm. the lip. It could have been missed, couldn't it? And you know? from that point it decided it could have been excruciatingly painful and we will never know. Mm. And from that point there was a change. Mm. But and sometimes, you know, you know, we get it a lot with rescue dogs, don't we, where we don't know what the past is. However, you know, we do we need to know because what is happening now is what we're dealing mm. with? You know, does it matter that what's happened or I mean that sometimes that's kind of used as an excuse, but what we're dealing with is the present. So in a way, with some dogs, we don't know. We've not got that background knowledge. No. So we've got to be able to work our way around that behaviour. So I think that's Critical, I think, you know, if I was advising anybody, if you know, who wants to get into dog behaviour, is I think it's absolutely paramount is that they get as much experience as they can with dogs. And I don't necessarily mean dogs with behavioural issues, I just mean dogs. Getting your hands on dogs, you know, if you work in a kennels or, you know, help a rescue centre, take dogs out, walk the dogs, because you'll understand dogs. There's most people, or there's a lot of people out there will only have maybe brought up one or two dogs, maybe from puppyhood in their lifestyle. I've been in a very enviable position where I've had my hands on an awful lot of dogs. And I understand that's not realistic. Most people don't get that opportunity. But you need to go out there and find those opportunities because you need to be confident in handling the dogs. I mean, thinking back many years ago, thinking back many years ago when I first started, one, I was very lucky because I had extremely good mentors around me yourself being one of them and Derek being the other one so I had a lot of knowledge around me but also I was allowed that ability to be able to find out and discover myself and my main teacher was dogs 
and that's mm. so important and we can't neglect that i also do of course i've used the textbooks so i've got an academic understanding as well but i don't think an academic understanding alone is good enough i think you need the hands-on and also also you need um you can gain knowledge for the experience of others and gaining experience from people who are already experienced well the academic side is overdone and of course it's promoted by academics of course not yeah. by mm. dog people and they think sometimes it has an elitist attitude mm. and uh, even a class mm. attitude i find mm. and it's it's so over overcooked mm. it, it's it's academic understanding is a framework it won't make you a good dog trainer more than a framework mm. and if you've got a highly skilled person who's learned hands-on mm. Then. It's that combination, isn't it? And also, a lot of dog people, or, and, and animal people, I mean, you know, I'm lucky I've experienced lots of other species as well, is those people, and I, I'm certainly one of those people, that you, you, you relate to animals and you, you enjoy that experience, you know, I'm not happy, I'm the happiest when I'm rolling around the fields with the dogs and the other animals and just having that one-on-one -on -one to them. But you also have to have extremely good people skills. And you've, got to, you've got to make sure you're, you're, as a behaviourist, the whole package. And if there's areas which you find difficult, you've got to make sure you get out there and fill those gaps because yeah. you've got a responsibility to your clients to make sure that you're delivering the best you can. So I might be the best behaviourist and dog trainer and I might be able to change that behaviour. But if I can't relay that to you as my client, then, you know, well, I'm never well, going to be successful. Well, I concur with that because, again, at the Cambridge Institute of Dog Behaviour and Training, uh, when I was teaching and tutoring, I would say to the students, you give me a person, because they used to think that the more knowledge they gained, the better the results mm. would be. And, and that sounds, you know, mm. that sounds intuitive. It sounds correct. Mm. And I would say, well, I've met hundreds many mm. hundreds of people who work in dog behavior and training and the most successful people the most successful and this is without equivocation mm. and the evidence is huge that i've seen you can have a moderate knowledge of dog behavior and training but excellent people skills yeah and that person will always take a client and dog to a higher standard mm. than somebody with excellent training skills and, and very yeah. poor you've got to be able human, to translate it mm. human skills mm. because one will not be listened to if they're not good with people mm. so as i said they are the you know the the client is a conduit of your knowledge mm. and if you, if they are offended or they think you're patronizing them or they think you don't listen really they stop listening mm. and the dog's then got no chance mm. obviously the best option is have somebody with a huge amounts of dog knowledge mm. training and behavior and good people skills but you see we're all learning and going back to what i said you know that you, you basically confirm what i'm saying that you know we've got to become that whole picture and if you know we're not all going to become out there you know we've all got to start our career somewhere we're not all going to be have excellent people skills excellent skills with all the different types of dog behavior and dealing with modification we've got to learn that but if we are aware of that and we're honest with ourselves about that where we need to improve our skill set through courses like like the cambridge institute courses practical courses which in my opinion are so valuable but we can we then are doing ourselves a real big favor and justice and also our clients because ultimately it's our clients you know i think nowadays particularly with social media and um, the internet in particular so much information out there it's trying to find clarity with what is the best information and um, i think people can forget that you know when we look on social media or youtube channels etc is we're seeing what somebody wants us to see and what we put out there so for that five second clip of the dog looking excellently behaved and reformed if you like we might two seconds later see a dog that has not changed his behavior well because it's done marketing has become you know 
open to more people and manipulated by more people. So I think it's important that people are realistic. And I think you don't have to, as a person starting off a career in dog training behavior, and I think it's the best career in the world. I'm having the best career. I, when I'm old and I'm sat in a chair and I can't do anything, I will better look back and reflect on such a superb career I've had. And I genuinely enjoy every case that I see and get a lot of satisfaction by what I do. But I had to learn it. And you're never going to be instant. And it goes back to that instant society. You've got to learn your craft. And that doesn't mean to say you don't see clients. What it means to say is that you get the information. If you need help, you need to be able to be part of organisations. Um, as we know, I've got strong links to the Guild of Dog Trainers. That's a great example of an organisation that's there to help people improve their skills and offer support to those people as well. So I think that's really overlooked. Back to that instant society. I've decided I'm going to be a dog trainer. I'm an expert. Let's get a bit of marketing out there, a bit of a social media channel. I'm now this amazing dog trainer. Now I'm a behaviorist. I can deal with this. It, be realistic. Be real to yourself as much as you are to your clients, I think. As the chairman of the Canine Feline Behaviour Association, we get a huge amount of applications each year. Mm. And only about three or four percent of people are successful in joining mm. because we have a strong way of assessing people and validating knowledge. Mm. So we get a group of academics coming in, often with animal behaviour degrees, mm. and I say to them, "That's fine, you know, mm. a degree is a degree." And they, because they've been taught it and led to believe that paramount, it's it mm. overwhelms all dog trainers because this is superior. Yeah, mm. you know, most of them come out of university. And you can't manage the most basic levels. Mm. Now, in fairness to some of them, they will go on to learn practical skills. Yeah. And they say, yes, okay, we'll learn behavior, we'll do clients and so on and so mm. forth with this degree or diploma behind them. And I say to them, yes, that's what you're doing and that's good. So you're learning the skills, but don't presume because somebody's been training and doing a behavior for 10 years that they can't read scientific books. Mm, mm. It works two ways. Yeah, yeah, not I agree. One way, mm. and and sometimes there's this like slight arrogance that I've got a degree and this is everything. And yeah, that means that I'm superior, and mm. I, I often put this down to the class system again. Slightly. Yeah. Mm. You know, yeah. you, you were taught, and I'm certainly was a product of that generation. That if you went to university, you were aware you, because you were told that you would be in the top four percent of the population if yes. you went to university and got a degree. So that was kind of yeah. that was ingrained in and the people in animal behavior because it's it's uh, we're the only organization that's a large amount of people degreed to ma and ba in canine specific yeah. behavior yeah specifically and you cannot mm. compare the two there's no comparison no. animal yeah. behavior is a generic mm. Mm. canine behavior is a species mm. or feline behavior is mm. a species mm. and i think and not just because that we're looking at a different species we've got to look at the place that a species has in society yes. because there's no other animal there that, that shares that yes. same becomes part of the family there's no other animal that we would just let off in the park and expect that we're going to mix it with other dogs come back mix it with anybody that it sees there isn't one the dog has a very unique place in society so yes i'm, I'm very well, behind what I you're have, saying there. i have conversations with academics again they've normally got a ma or a bsc in in um animal behavior and one of the conversations I have with them when they're applying to the CFBA, I go straight into canine behavior mm. and I say to them, what qualifications do you have? That? What part of your degree? In the same way with a, a person without a degree comes to the CFBA and says, I'm skilled as a dog trainer. I've done behavior for five mm. years. I've done 200 cases. We examine them with the same thoroughness yeah. and we validate, we interview their clients. I don't think anybody else does this. No. We interview all the clients and sometimes uh, academics will come back at me or people have got an academic degree and say, well, you know, we believe in science and they hold this word of science as if this is a kind of eureka. I, I could have just interrupt you there and say that you and I are very responsible for that word science because we produced a film called Science Led Dog Training about nine years ago, I think we filmed that. And we, I remember us quite very, very clearly so they're thinking about the name of this because it did deal with science. And I think you coined the phrase Science Led Dog Training well, for that but film. But and that was the, 
big, that's yeah. been the big <laughs> push of the overuse of the word science. I doubt, and that was because you, in that film, you were specifically going into the study of um, scientific operant conditioning. Yeah, I'm learning theories, yeah. And you were mm. explaining operant conditioning, yeah. and I thought that was a great time. Which was valuable for dog yeah, trainers. For mm. But sometimes I have to remind people with uh, academic degrees, you know, when they're using this word science, mm. I say to them, you know, at the end of the day, because you're using the word science, it doesn't make you an expert in dog behavior or training. No. Coming out with a degree. It doesn't. Mm, mm. It makes you have, you have theory and ideas that you've mm. been taught. And it could, you can argue very clearly that dog training behavior is, is an art element. I mean, how many times well, is, do you see many, you see so many students and people working dogs or even yes. owners with the pet dogs and you just look at them and they've just got it. It, they've just got it. They're, it's yeah. something special you can't put, but they've just and got some it. Some of the most skilled can't explain how they've got yeah, it. Because but they've got they it. they might not be mm. good at articulating the mm. knowledge base. But you can watch it and identify but yourself. An academic can come out and tell me why he thinks they're skilled, mm. but he can't do it. Mm. Mm. They can do it. He mm. can't do it. So academics often say to me, well, you know, we're scientifically trained. I said, well, you know, in my middle age, I was scientifically trained in dog behaviour. Um, but let me put it this way, the, many of the best chefs in the world, there's science in cookery mm. and some of the best chefs in the world cannot explain the science of cookery mm. in depth or articulate it to a degree level. Mm. But no scientist, to the best of my knowledge, has become one of the best chefs in the world who understands the chemistry and the science of cookery. Mm. So we have to, you know, you have to hold your horses. Mm. It's good to have education. Mm. It's good if you go to the It's just a component, degree, isn't it, basically? But it's not sometimes what they think it it's is. It's not the be all and So when all. people apply to the CFPA, I'm looking for people who we will be proud of mm. and we won't get complaints because we rarely ever get a complaint. Mm. It's so rare because the people we select can do the job. And the criteria for that is that they're skilled. Mm. Now, if they've got a degree, mm. whether it's in animal behavior or dog behavior, they still have to have the overwhelming knowledge of practice and skill and success and results. Yeah. Mm. And I've never noticed the day today that the degree gives them an edge. Mm. Some of the people might differ with me, mm. but I've met a lot of people in 40 years mm. and I don't see the edge. Mm. But, you know, I myself eventually got, got a degree mm. as a learning component. How quickly things happen when you're dealing with dog behaviour and you're, you're dealing with training. You're dealing with an animal that's doing something in that moment. You know, you, you're not thinking to yourself, now what theory am I now going to have to yeah. apply now? Because you've had to make a, an instant decision. Yeah. Um, and the person with the theory is not there. Mm. Mm. And you've got to be able to react in a hundred different ways in mm. situations that you've got to accumulate that knowledge mm. in your subconscious mm. so that you can call upon it within a fraction of a second. An adapt, second, adapt. Yes. Mm. So the Canine and Feline Behaviour Association is about having the best skilled people that we offer to the public. And I think that's why you've got the organisation has got the reputation of excellence because it insists on excellence. Okay, so we'll end that there Sue. And uh, thank you for talking about that. Thank you.